This right here represents my students' binders and what they would look like at the end of each school year after having taken my class where we spent every day either taking notes or completing practice like or application activities and then storing them in this binder so they had access to all of it when it came time to prepare for their end of the year or end of course exam. Ugh. Now, whether you teach little babies in elementary school or big babies in high school, and I mean that in the most lovingly motherly way, you've experienced what is the drag and drop Circa 2012-ish, that's a total estimation, drag and drop became a major soft skill, maybe not such a soft skill, for all students starting at about age two when new age testing dropped into our lives, pun intended. And when we drag and drop on paper, otherwise known as literally cutting and pasting, right? Not digitally cutting and pasting, here's what happens. Now, there is absolutely a time and place for all of those things. For instance, at the time of this recording, my four, almost five-year-old is working on his fine motor skills and using scissors and gluing microscopic sized pieces of paper onto his handout helps with that. But... The later elementary years through high school level, where the more important thing really is, and here's our important idea of the day, that the information is in their brain, right? That's the goal. That's the measure and all be all. Maybe all the paper and cutting and gluing isn't worth all the hassle when really we just need them to know the stuff that's on the paper. So the question then becomes, well, what do we do instead, right? So if our students need to have that drag and drop skill for their testing that is mostly digital now, at least when it comes to like the high stakes kind of stuff, but also all of the cutting and pasting and paper and glue and scissors and all of that can be, but not always is a lot, maybe a little extra when we really just wanna drive home some concepts, right? So oftentimes we turn to a word processor, especially when we're trying to ditch the paper, right? We turn to a word processor. The elderly millennial generation, if you're in my generation, and older generations, First love affair on the computer, good old Word, later replaced by the scandalous Google Doc. <laughs> nope, even those, those won't cut it for cut and paste. Oop, there's another pun. So what are we to use instead and how do we use it? I'd like to introduce you to a good friend of mine and that is Google Draw. Wait, is it Google Drawings? It's I call it Google Draw. You can call it Google Drawings. It's the same thing. In today's video, I'm not only going to walk you through how to create a Google drawing to be used in your classroom, but also show you some examples and how to be prepared for the end of days, that happens kind of often, when the internet goes out at your building in the middle of your in like internet dependent lesson that you immaculately created after hours of blood, sweat, and tears, all while being observed by your principal. Ever had that happen? Let me know in the comments because it's absolutely happened. So let's ditch the paper teacher friend and let's use Google Draw. That's what we're talking about today. So let's get to it. Well, hey there and welcome back to my channel. I am Mandy Rice of teachonamission.com and the Sustainable Teacher Podcast. And here on this platform, we are releasing weekly content for teachers to help reinvigorate your love of teaching, but doing so in ways that allow you to be effective with today's post-pandemic and modern students and build sustainable systems in your classroom, right? So that you can have both. That's B-O-T-H, both. Be effective with your students and have a personal life. Anybody else remember what those are like? Yeah, we should all have one of those. And just because you're a teacher doesn't mean you can't have one. 
you can have both teacher friend and that's what this channel is all about and so if you are nodding like yes yes this is absolutely something I need in my life please go ahead and click to like this video click to subscribe to this channel and the little notification bell so that you are notified each time one of our new videos is coming out on a weekly maybe even more so basis I really appreciate you doing so and let's go ahead and jump right into today's video. So the first thing you wanna do is get to your Google Drive, right? So you wanna be on your Google account and go to Google Drive. Swing this over here really quickly. And you want to get into whatever folder you're going to get into. You're just seeing all kinds of my folders and you're gonna click new, but you'll see that Google Draw isn't, or drawings, isn't readily available, but is like the next thing. So click or hover over more, go to Google Drawings, and you will be shown this. <clears throat> now, before we get into exactly what it looks like to create one of these and be giving you some like tips and tricks, I want to show you not only some examples, but talk to you about how you might be able to use this in your own classroom. So the first thing, and I actually, it's so funny, I was just on Instagram as I was eating lunch and just kind of scrolling through some things and saw Duh, I used to do this and I totally forgot. You can create your seating charts on here, right? Simple as that. You can go and create a shape that is the shape of your desk, right? And then in the center of that, just double click on that shape. I'm gonna center it in lots of different ways and I'm just gonna say teacher's desk. Bam, right? And if you're not wanting to print these and it'd be all colorful. You could always click to print in black and white, but you can make any of these shapes, different colors and all kinds of fun things. So then, so you can just create, let's say here's your first student desk, right? But I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste that just a few times rather than recreating that. I just clicked C Command C or on a PC, you click Control C and then Command or Control V, right? So I had my desks in clusters of four or five. They were even like touching. So however you wanna set that up, just get your desks set up. Then what you're gonna do is actually create a text box and you're gonna put it over here. Okay, I like to always center mine. I don't, I just always do. Um, and I'm going to put my students' names, right? So uh, I'm going to make it a little smaller though because I wanna be able to fit lots of them onto, onto my page here. So I'm going to click on that and click Command CV again and I'm going to change the name. Right, I'm just gonna add all of my students. Command V again. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting Monica and Ross's last, Geller. Duh. Okay, just adding these little names, you get the idea, right? Boom. Oh, I can't forget. How do you spell her last name though? Who, who's my uh, friends fans and knows how to spell buffet? Oh gosh, <laughs> I don't even know how to. I have no idea how to spell her last name. I feel so ashamed as a Friends fan. But here we go. Okay. Oh, and Joey. I don't even know Joey's last name. Tribbiani. See, I say that I don't know these things, but I absolutely do. Tribbiani. Let's just, let's just go with that. I bet it's an A, not an O. Okay. So then once you get all of your students' names in here, then you can drag and drop them where they go. But then... Let's say that it's time for another, okay, let's just get all of our, our names here, okay? So we've got these guys. Okay, and I've got all of my students placed on here, but now, now it's time to rearrange seats. Well, then all you have to do is drag and drop their names. That's all you have to do, right? That is all you have to do. Now, one little tip that I wanna give you is that if you want, are wanting to print these out, which you probably are, because you want them available for your sub or anybody who's coming in to help you out and know where kids are sitting. My big tip, and you're gonna wanna actually do this before you start creating all the shapes and stuff, is click on File and go to Page Setup. Click on um, a different size. So the default is the widescreen, I think 16 by whatever it is. So I'm gonna click and go to custom. Now I want to print this as an eight and a half by 11 piece of computer paper. And you'll notice that I'm on inches. I could change that to other things, 
but inches generally is what I'm looking for when it comes to printing to a certain type or a size of paper. But I want mine to be in landscape, not portrait. And so, and that's not really a thing on Google Draw because it's not necessarily meant to be printed, although it absolutely could be. So I'm actually going to make mine long, right? 11 by eight and a half, click apply, and then it's a landscape sized page. So that when I finally go do, go to print it, it will actually print as a piece of computer paper. Okay, so that's one way that you could use Google Draw is with your seating charts. But let's talk about kind of mostly what I was hinting at in that introduction of this video, which is those drag and drop activities. So I'm going to show you a couple of mine that I've created for my AP Psychology classes um, and that lots of teachers are using um, that, and, and you can grab it from my Teachers Pay Teachers store if you are happen to be an AP Psychology teacher, but that is very, very small group of people um, compared to like an ELA or math or something like that. So here is one such activity. Okay, so in AP Psychology, in unit two, biological bases, it was very scientific. It was very anatomical. It was about the anatomy of the brain um, and the neuron and very, there's lots of parts and things, okay? So my students need to be able to label or know the parts of a neuron, just like they do of the brain, um, and know parts of the nervous system, blah, blah, blah. We did all kinds of activities with the brain and the neuron, like um, a candy neuron or a Play-Doh brain and all kinds of things. And those are really fun and have a purpose and we still did those. But I also wanted a really quick way to assess, do they really know the parts of the neuron? But here's the other kicker and something that I want you to hear me, like get rid of your distractions if you have them, hear them, hear me on this one. It's not only that I wanted a quick way to assess them, I wanted a quick way to know. <laughs> I wanted a quick way to grade or to gauge how are they doing. And me looking at every single one of my students' candy neuron wasn't necessarily a way to do it. Now, I found ways to like, had the students take a little picture of it and they had everything labeled and that was super quick, but I wanted them to be able to do it this way as well. And if you're in a course where your end of course exam or whatever that looks like in your state, you have this drag and drop like questions, you have to get those type questions in front of them from go. Okay, so this is just an example. You'll notice that all the colorful boxes are off here to the side and they've got the directions here to drag and drop these. I found a picture on Creative Commons that I was able to use and then they're just directions. Drag each of the color box text boxes to the correct empty box corresponding to its part on the image of the neuron below. Simple as that. So they can come over here and find the crosshairs and boom, drag it wherever wherever it goes. Now, a little tip that I'll give you here is that when you're creating something like this, make sure that all of the boxes on the like, where they're plopping them, right? These boxes on the actual quote paper, even though it's not really a paper, are the same size. Because even though like this one is going to overlap wherever it ends up going, in fact, it's over here, it's over on the bottom here, it's going to overlap, it's fine, it doesn't matter. It, it, what's key here is that the box didn't give away where that answer should have gone, if that makes sense. So you might be thinking, well, then you probably have a key for this, right? You are exactly right. And here's a little hack for you. When you are creating something like this, create the key first, okay? And I'm gonna show you and kind of walk you through how exactly I did that, but you want to create the key first so get it all created like this and then you can take these little boxes and you can drag them over here. Just a little, little tidbit for you. Now, here is another example. So this is an activity of mine from um, the psychotherapies unit or clinical psychology unit, which is towards the end of the course. And it is incredibly content heavy. There are a lot of things. I have to know the type of therapy, um, the pros and cons of therapy, just all kinds of things. And we use lots of graphic organizers. I'm sure you use lots of graphic organizers in your course. And whether they use that for note taking or just organization of thoughts in general, right? That's what it's all about. But I wanted to be able to kind of use 
that not only to help them organize it, but then to just quickly get a little assessment of it and while they are practicing as well. I will say that in my course, we did a lot of um, students creating examples. Always a great skill, especially if they ever have to go and write. But sometimes I just gave them examples because they needed that skill as well to be able to identify because it was just quicker. And that's kind of an example here. Now you'll notice this one is a bit trickier because there are three columns and blanks in all three. So not only do they have to, it's not just saying what is the therapy aiming at, right? Or who are they targeting? They also have to be able to identify the other terms and such as well. Um, so this one's pretty simple. You just drag it where, where it belongs. Again, make the key first. So here's the key. Make that first, then drag these outside and just make sure that you don't just drag like this keeping them in order where they go. Like you don't want to do that and then making it super easy for them to drag where it goes. Just kind of mix it, mix it up a little bit. Okay, let me get all of these back where they go. Okay, so now what I would like to do is show you a little bit of the how. And the way that I'm going to do that is essentially just show you the different techniques and things, different tools in our little toolbar up here that I have used to make either or any of those examples that I was showing you before. So the first thing that you need to know about a shape versus a text box is that they really are the same thing because a shape you can add text to, right? And a text box you can add a color and a border to. It's just often if you want text inside of a circle, you're gonna wanna create the shape first. So if you want text inside of anything other than a rectangle or square, you should create the shape first. And that's oftentimes where, where I start is with a shape, okay? So I'm just gonna start with a basic one here. And I'm going to put the title in this bad boy and I want it to be kind of large-ish. I'm gonna choose, you know, whatever font that I want and I'm going to call it something. How to use Google Draw, <laughs> right? And then over here, I'm going to select another shape and I'm gonna to explain to you why. And I'm going to, I just like things to kind of match up. I really do. I, I like that they kind of go together there, but I'm gonna make the background of this one white. You can also, you have lots of options here, right? You can click gradient and make it, you know, something else if you'd like, totally up to you. You can also make a bigger border if you would like. So I'm gonna make it like 24 point. Wow, that's really big, right? Like we don't need it that much. And then I'm going to double click and you'll see that there will be text there. So for directions, I'm going to make it a little smaller and I'm also going to make it up at the top. So directions, start here, you know, whatever your directions are and you'll kind of fill that space with those. Now, if you're wanting to have more of a graphic organizer type look like this one, really the simplest way to do that is go over to insert and add a table. Okay, so mine was three columns and however many rows deep. And you'll notice that it is still transparent, but I'm gonna make it just fill the page. I don't know, I'm just gonna make it fill this, this page, right? And I'm going to select the table and I'm gonna make it have a white background so that all the checkered things are kind of gone, right? Um, and you can make your table uh, lines to be black instead of just gray. You can make them a little thicker if you would like, which is helpful, especially if you're going to be printing this, like for your little elementary babies and cutting and pasting and all of that. Um, so yeah, I recommend um, having those larger lines there. And then you can just make the table work however you would like, right? So I made this row up here um, short or um, more narrow, right? Click there and I'm going to make it all centered. And I'm just gonna say example, <laughs> right? Definition, 
um, I don't application. This is totally very broad and vague and I have no, I'm just making this up as I go. Okay, <clears throat> then what I'm going to do to create my options of what they are dragging and dropping, I'm gonna go with a shape again. I'm gonna make that shape, however big you're gonna need it for your text. And I'm gonna make sure that there's a decent size outline on it, right? Get my text and all of that that I want. You wanna go pretty small with your text depending on if it's one word or, or if it's a longer paragraph. And then I'm going to make it centered again, okay? Now, take that first one that you have, make it the color, whatever color that you're wanting to make it, right? And plop it where it goes, right? Remember my hack? Make the key first. Make the key first. So I know that it goes here, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is Command C, Command V, that bad boy, and I'm gonna plop it somewhere else, and I'm immediately going to change its color and, you know, the text that makes it the correct answer, right? And then I'm gonna do it again, and I'm going to immediately change the color, right? And then the text, until I have the whole darn thing figured out, right? Change that color. Now, you might be wondering, what's with the colors? I don't feel like doing all the, I don't need all the colors. Well, the colors are kind of cute, they're kind of pretty, but here's a hack for you. If you are distracted, come back to me. This is so, so key, and I only learned this later on after assigning quite a few thingamajiggers. You're gonna learn, or you're gonna see, I have all of these colorful, bright colors, maybe not so bright on this one, but that's because I had so many, right? So many colors. There's a reason why. So when you go to assign these on Google Classroom, okay, so for instance, the functions of the neuron, I'm gonna assign that on Google Classroom. I can see all of the little thumbnails of them working on it live. You can see this, right? In Google Classroom, you can see that Joe hasn't even started and John is almost done and, and everywhere in between, right? Well, once you're seeing where these are going, you're gonna think, oh, well, I have to open every single one and I gotta read them all. Mm -mm, no, you don't. As long as you use those pretty colors, those really bright, differentiated colors for the most part. Because now what you'll be able to do, you could split screen it if you want or just memorize where the colors go. I don't know, it's just totally up to you. Split screen your key with Google Classroom because then all you have to do is eyeball it. And I can see right away that Sally doesn't have the bright yellow one in the most upper left box on her assignment. I know that she got that wrong. Now, whether or not you take that for points or however you're going to grade that, you can then quickly just from an eyeball's glance, right? See how your students are doing on these drag and drop activities. Okay, now let's say that you want students, you're gonna you know, assign this on Google Classroom, you're gonna keep it totally digital, but you want some students to write something, right? So let's say that this one actually goes over here and in this application part, you're actually gonna give directions that says in the application, column you're going to apply this to your own life come up with an example um, of your own life or come up with an for instance in my ap psychology class would be an frq prompt or question something like that which is their writing right that's the type of writing they had to do so go ahead and click in there and you're going to type type here do you have to do that no but it's just like a, a quick way for your students to see oh that's where i can actually click in there and type now <clears throat> if they keep on typing and typing and typing and typing it's going to go longer so you could just say to your students you only have to fill that space if it goes a little long who cares because you'll notice the table just keeps going down you're going to still be able to see everything so that's not a huge deal if your students go over there. The other thing I'll say is to think outside of this box. You kind of like I showed you in the examples, you don't only have to work within the designated box, right? You can work outside of it by putting some directions over here. All that is is a shape filled in with white and outlined in black and some text in it, right? You can go outside the box. Now, what I'll say is if you go to print this and use it that way, my understanding is, and you know what, I'm gonna test this, 
while I'm here is that it's not going to print anything. Yep, I was right. It's not going to print off of the Google drawing itself. Okay. So <clears throat> if you're wanting to do that, just make sure that, let's say I'm going to make my table here really small. I'm going to drag these over, right? Drag my key. Oh, um, but I'm making the example, right? So I'm going to put some, I don't know. Well, I don't need more directions. I'm just going to put each of these here, right? Over on this side. And now when I go to print, those do in fact show up. Okay, so if you're wanting to print this, just have something as a backup. Um, you definitely want to make sure that everything that your students will be needing for it is on the little Google Draw canvas itself. Okay, but if not, if you're keeping it digital, I love using outside of the box. Okay, here's another little tip for you. Sometimes when students go to drag on these, they'll click and then they will try to drag. But as you notice there, I was in the center. Okay, so if I click and then I click to drag, all I'm doing is selecting that text. And sometimes they'll click and they'll click to drag and they'll do something like that. And I have to say from experience with my students, it's a little triggering for them, especially if they don't have the fine motor skills that they need to find the crosshairs first. I told my students, it was like this motto that we had throughout my classroom. Wait for, find the crosshairs. That's what we said, not wait for it. Find the crosshairs, then drag and drop, <laughs> right? Then click and drag, right? Find the crosshairs, then drag and drop. But if you are not wanting to do that, here is a little workaround for you. So you have your all of your answers created, right? You're going to click to screenshot. So on my Mac, or if you're using a Mac, it would be command shift four. And Command Shift 3 is a screenshot of my entire screen. This is a little snipping tool. It's Command Shift 4. Okay, so on a PC, you have a snipping tool. Just go down in the bottom left hand corner, click your little launch pad guy, and look for a snipping tool. And you're going to get your little crosshairs here, and you're going to take what it is essentially a picture of that. Okay, well, there it is. Now I'm going to drag it onto here. I'm going to erase this one. And what I'm going to do is make it the size that I need to make it. And bam, there we go. Now, could they still select and like drag it and make it bigger? Sure, but hey, at least now they can't change the text. So if you're wanting them to not change the text because you're worried about that for whatever type of activity that you have, this screenshotting little hack would help as well. Okay, that's it guys. That really is how you use Google Draw to create different activities inside of your classroom or a seating chart, whatever it is that you're needing for your students, right? But the key here is that it can also then be a quick measure for you to gauge, okay, are they getting this or not? And those colors, that's gonna be huge. But let me remind you of a few things. That first one is to color code that key, right? These are all things that I've mentioned. I'm just reminding you before we kind of wrap it up here. The, you've got to color code that key so you don't have to read it all, <laughs> right? Work smarter, not harder. That way you can just eyeball from the bird's eye view in Google Classroom. And that is, of course, if you're grading it with a more fine tooth comb. I did not always do that. You could instead be more like me and just give your students the key in the station that you're having them do this activity or whenever you're having them do it after they've had some time to work on it. Yes, I did that and then I didn't grade it. Did some of my students sit there and do nothing? Honestly, very few. Very few just sat there and did nothing. Um, and that was not because they came to me that way, right? That was because I set the precedent on what that time was to be used for. So whenever you are giving students your keys, you have to set the tone. You have to set that environment. Another quick tip is if you're having students type into whether it's a column or a box or wherever, make sure there is an indication as to where they do that, right? And an indication of an appropriate amount of text, which is oftentimes indicated by the amount of space. If they go over, probably isn't all that 
big of a deal, right? I use these, another tip here is to use them in stations. I use these most oftentimes in stations, meaning that my students only had a designated amount of time to get it done. And then yes, I did let them see the key because the point of this was not that it was one even completed or that it was all pretty and color coded. It was, is the information in their brain and you got to do so quickly because ain't nobody got time for that. We've got to move on, right? And so having a little bit of time pressure, we had to kind of wean into that. It didn't happen from day one. These station activities, which were full of things similar to what I showed you in today's video, they helped my students with that kind of time crunch. You could also use any of these drag and drop like activities um, for a lower level practice activity, right? Or, and you can use them as differ a differentiated task after maybe they've watched one of your flipped videos in class, um, if you're doing an in-class flip, or you could, like I was explaining earlier and what I did in my classroom, use them in stations. It's totally up to you. Well, I hope that all of these kind of tips and tricks and different ways to kind of best practices inside of a Google Draw are helping you to truly ditch the paper. Not that that itself is our goal. There's nothing wrong with paper, right? But it can be overwhelming. It can make a mess. It can be a little bit more than is necessary if our goal is to make sure that our students are actually Actually mastering the content. So I hope you find that helpful. And if you do, please remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you are not missing a single one of our videos coming out every single week. And please leave me a comment. Was this helpful for you? Do you know about Google Drawings? Have you used it before? Did you learn anything new? And is there anything else that you would like me to show you maybe in a future video? All right, we will see you here same time next week. Bye, everybody.